Alors, le professeur Cafero, il est professeur d'histoire à la Vanderbilt University, Nashville, Tennessee. Et il est, entre autres, parce qu'il a écrit d'autres articles, un spécialiste de euh, problèmes, disons, militaires dans l'Italie du XIVe siècle. De, deux ouvrages qui ont été publiés à Johns Hopkins University Press en 1998 et 2006. Le premier, « Mercenary Companies on the Decline of Siena ». Et le deuxième, John Oakwood, An English Mercenary in the 14th Century Italy. Donc, je remercie M. De Vries et je lui donne la parole. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, Professor Caffaro sends his regrets. Um, he, unfortunately, his wife is ill and he is not able to attend. Uh, he asked me to read the, book, uh, the paper uh, and um, I'm glad to do so. But I'm afraid that I'm not an expert in the field. So the questions may have to be more in a discussion format uh, where we all can pitch in rather than, than me trying to answer something I don't know about. The decade of the 1360s was an active one for English military involvement in Italy. The White Company arrived in 1361, shortly after the Peace of Brittany, 1360, and terrorized the northern part of the peninsula. Edward de Spencer came in 1368, and Duke Lionel, King Edward III's son, for the latter's wedding to the daughter Violante of Galizio, uh, Galizio Visconti, ruler of Pavia. Lionel's death immediately after the ceremony in October of 1368 set off the so-called English Revenge. De Spencer and members of, the Lionel, of, the Lion, of Lionel's retinue refused to give back Violante's dowry and fought the Visconti, inflaming much of the Piedmont. The events are described in detail by contemporary Italian writers who were deeply Im impressed by English fighting skill and are well known to modern scholars. Lionel's uh, wedding ban banquet has been described as a signal event in medieval culinary history on account of the 14 lavish courses served. And as a key moment in medieval literary history due to the presence of Fran uh, Francis Petrarch, Jean Foissart, and perhaps a young Geoffrey Chaucer, for whom Lionel was an early pa patron. Literary critics have taken the lead in studying the banquet. They have speculated on the possible effects of the assembly on Chaucer, who may have gained his first acquaintance with Italian literature there and whether the unknown author of the anonymous alliterative English poem, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, was also in attendance, perhaps with a patron or possible model for his Green Knight. This last is all the more int intriguing because Anne R. Meyer has recently connected Edward Dispenser to the Gowan poet on the basis of his ties to the Northwest Midlands and the circle of King Richard II, viewed as central to the authorship and patronage of the poem. This paper examines the connection between English soldiers and the city of Florence at the time. After its career up north, the White Company went to Tuscany in 1363 to fight for Pisa against Florence, where John Hawkwood, the greatest soldier of the era, gained his first experience as a full-fledged captain. Meanwhile, Ed Edward de Spencer traveled to Florence, or so it has been argued, in 1368-9 to fight on behalf of the city now allied with the papacy against the Visconti. His presence in Florence is immortalized in the Via Veritatis, church militant fresco, uh, what Vasari called the Order of St. Dominic fresco, on the eastern wall of the chap Spanish chapel in the church of Santa Maria Novella, painted by Andrea di uh, Buenaitu, uh, between the years 1366 and 1368. Here is a, a detail of one of the, uh, one of the, the parts of the fresco. Um, there's the, all wars, walls are covered by the painting, and this is a close-up uh, that, we will, that uh, Bill is focusing on. The Spencer, dressed in white, stands toward the middle of the lower section of the fresco, which includes St. Dominic and Thomas Aquinas to the far right, and closer to Edward and behind him, contemporaries such as Pope Urban V and Emperor Charles IV. Um, there's the, there's Edward Dispenser referred to there, and the Pope and Emperor there. 
The Spencer has been identified by the garter on his leg, the emblem of King, Arthur, or King Edward's Order of the Garther, Garter, of which he was a member. T.B. Pugh stressed the singularity of the portrait, which is the first representation of an Englishman in Italy apart from Thomas Becket. It stands as a precursor to the more well-known portrait of Dispenser's English counterpart, John Hawkwood by Paolo Cello in the Florentine Duomo. The presence of an Englishman in so prominent a place begs the question, what was the nature of English service in Florence at, the, at this time? An answer is possible owing to the rich documentary sources in the Florentine archives, which include budgets of the Camera del Comune and, and acts of the City Council Provisioni that give um, admirably close detail. The same documents indicate that these years were transformative ones for the Florentine army, during which the city first adopted the lance unit that would become standard in its armies. They also indicate that Edward Dispenser was likely never in the city and that Despite the current art historical consensus, he is likely not the figure in the Spanish chapel. Instead, the sources highlight the activities of Dispenser's brother Hugh, a less uh, known figure and who, those of an entirely obscure figure, Oshino Archieri, known in Florence as the Green Knight, Lo Scudiere, Scudiere Verde. The two men provide important insight into the transformation of the Florentine army the identity of those in the Via Veritatis, um, Veritatis sorry, fresco in Santa Maria Novella, and perhaps, I assert this cautiously, the authorship of the Gowan poem. In any case, the essay shows that when scholars look closely at mercenaries, a subject superfluous to most current analyses of Trecento Italian society, I blame Machiavelli, Bill writes, the analysis changes. This is my most basic aim. When Buonoito made uh, or began painting the ch Spanish chapel in 1366, there were few English soldiers on the Florentine payroll. The point is noteworthy because only two years earlier, the city had many Englishmen in its employ, bought off from Pisan employ by means of a bribery. The newly hired English did not, however, get along with the German mercenaries, and after the war, Florence dismissed its English. Uh, the Germans remained. Florentine budgets show that in, by 1366, the English only had, uh, I'm sorry, the city only had one Englishman on its payroll. This was Oshino Archieri, first hired in the winter of 1365 after the Pisan War. Archer, as we shall call him, was captain constabile of, banner, of a banner unit, consisting of 20 cavalrymen, including himself. The banner was the standard unit employed in the Florentine army at this time. It is unclear how Archer and his unit were integrated into the overall Florentine army. What is clear, however, is that he remained in Florentine service for the next few years, four years, working on consecutive four-month contracts until 1370. He is identified in the sources by the nickname the Green Squire, the Green Knight, a sobriquet uh, that first appears in 1368, the same year that Archer was paid 100 florin bonus for certain services rendered on behalf of the city, a payment that suggests he had earned special status with his employer such, uh, since such emolements emul were rare. The presence of an English knight of color, as it were, in Italy was to be sure not unique. Richard Moussard, a contemporary Englishman who served as the personal bodyguard of the Green Count, Amadeus of Savoy, was known as the Black Squire. Simon Newton, a uh, soldier in papal service, was, like Archer, known as the Green, as the Green Squire. J.R.A.L. Highfield has argued for a connection between Simon New Newton and the Gowan poet. Simon Newton's brother, Richard Newton, of Macclesfield in Staffordshire in the northwestern Midlands, has been suggested as the author of the Gowan poem, a proposition that gains further credence from the fact that Humphrey Newton, a descendant of Simon and Hugh, was the first to demonstrate an acquaintance with the poem. We may wonder whether our green squire, Archer, and Simon Newton were linked or perhaps even the same person. It was not uncommon for mercenary soldiers to use pseudonyms in the, at this time, but this is not the case. Newton returned home to England in 1368 and is cited in English documents in February 1368 when he crossed from Dover to Calais in the service of a King Edward III. Archer remained in Florentine service, where his presence is proven by local documents. 
After two years of employ with Florence on December 8, 1367, Archer was rehired by the city according to a new contract that placed him in charge of a lance unit of cavalry rather than a banner unit. Archer was thus the first English captain employed by Florence in this manner, joined on the next day by four countrymen, William Bocost, Edward de Bertram, Utieri de Loren, and John of London. Each commanded a single lance unit consisting of three men and three horses. On the 10th and 11th of December, Florence hired 25 additional single uh, English lance units. The month of December 1367 saw therefore the first signs of a shift in the organization of the Florentine army when the lance made its first appearance. The formation would become standard in Florence, used of the 15th century and beyond, with often large contingents of 100 lances or more. That the English played the leading role is perhaps not surprising. The Florentine chronicler Filippo Villani claimed that the English were the first in Italy who conducted horsemen under the name of a lance. But Villani's statement refers to the composition of the White Company in 1363, then in Pisan employ. What is unclear is why Florence did not adopt the unit until the winter of 1367, four years after the city presumably first encountered it. Moreover, the shift occurred when Florence was not at war. In 1367, the city faced the usual threats, marauding companies, obstreperous feudal clans in the countryside, and rebellions, but it undertook no major offenses or battles. Just exactly what the shift to lances meant is, of course, an open question. Was it largely an administrative change or a tactical one? The historians Stephen uh, Seltzer and Paolo Grillo have argued the latter for Italy more generally, stressing that the lance facilitated the dismounting technique used by the English cavalry in the Hundred Years' War. It is difficult to say whether this is true for Florence because we do not know precisely what the banner unit, banner unit it replaced looked like how many horses each captain had, how it was deployed in the field, and so forth. Nevertheless, the shift in Florence corresponded with developments elsewhere in Italy. Seltzer has noted the introduction of the lance unit in the armies of Perugia, Venice, and the Papacy in 1367-68. Perhaps Florence responded to its counterparts. In any case, the use of lances in Florence occurred gradually. As of early 1368, the lance units in the Florentine army remained small and shared space with banner units, which were more common. The new unit, therefore, did not simply replace the old one. Even among Englishmen, the banner unit persisted. While Archer captained, uh, captained a lance unit in December 1367, his fellow Englishman, Richard Romsey, who had gained a considerable reputation in Italy, captained a banner unit of cavalrymen, as did several other countrymen. In addition, Hungarian cavalrymen in, hung in Florentine service did not use the lance unit at all. They remained in their own contingents, consisting of 12 to 14 horsemen. German, Italian, Burgundian, and Gascon cavalrymen all adopted the lance formation. The Burgundians did so early, just after the English. Italian mercenaries appear to have been the slowest to change. The lance did not become commonplace among them until 1369. <clears throat> Florentine documents trace a significant military buildup in the years 1368 and 1369, owing in large part to the start of war in April 1368 between Milan and the Papacy and the arrival in Italy of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles IV to support the Pope. When Charles moved into Tuscany in September 1368, he touched off rebellion against a Florentine authority in San Miniano, Al Tedesco which ultimately brought war between the city and Milan in 1369. The war hastened the transformation of the Florentine army, although banner units remained in use and the size of lance units grew. Now all Englishmen in Florentine service captained such contingents. Oshino Archer captained 12 lances, Richard Romsey 10 lances, and Johannem uh, Todinam 30 lances. The Florentine army fought against Milanese forces led by John Hawkwood near the town of Caschina, near Pisa, in December 1369. The Florentine diarist Donato Valuti estimated the overall size of the Florentine cavalry at 3,000 horsemen, of which 400 were arrayed in lances. The com composition of Hawkwood's Milanese army is uncertain. Hawkwood nevertheless won the day, defeating the Florentines at Caschina, executing, a, according to the chronicles, a flanking maneuver that surrounded the enemy. 
Chronicle accounts make no except explicit mention of the role played by lances, but when Florence reassembled its army in 1370, it now had for the first time large lance units, including one of 170 lances, under the command of the German captain Conrad Weitingen. There remained several banner units, but the defect of Caschina was clearly to encourage the use of lance units. Instead, the next time we see the Florentine army in the field against a major opponent, the papacy in 1375 in the War of the Eight Saints, the cavalry was composed almost exclusively of lance units, some 2,350 lances according to contemporary accounts. At this point we may return our discussion to where we began, with Edward de Spencer and our Green Knight. It was Florence's war against Milan that purportedly brought de Spencer to the city under the attention of the artist Andrea Buonoico. Included him, in, uh, included him in the Via Ver, Ver, Veritatis fresco at Santa Maria Novella, but de Spencer appears nowhere in Florentine documentary sources, either before or after the Battle of Caschina. Mary Devlin, who made this assertion, which has gone unchallenged, based it on an extant letter by Pope Urban V, Florence's ally, which requested de Spencer's presence in Florence. But Devlin did not consult the actual letter, but rather a summary of it in the candle, uh, calendar of papal registers. The original in the Archivio uh, Segreto Vaticano makes clear that Dispenser remained up north in Piedmont, fighting alongside the Marquis of Montferrat against Galeazzo Visconti. Indeed, as late as October 1369, Edward was still north, receiving a loan from Montferrat in return for the possession of the towns he held as part of Lionel's original dowry, and a promise to serve Montferrat for another eight months. Urban V's letter does, however, make clear that Edward served the papacy, which was all allied to Montferrat. This may yet justify his inclusion in the Via Virtutatis fresco, which commemorated, among others, those who took arms on behalf of the church. But did Artis Buonotto directly observe a, a dispenser, as has been assumed, and could not have completed the painting in 1368 as he was supposed to. Florence had not yet allied itself with Urban V until late November 1369. Indeed, prior to that, the city was on bad terms with the pontiff. English mercenaries were there at odds with the were therefore at odds with the papacy. Urban V did not support Lionel's marriage to Violante Visconti, and when Edward de Spencer came to Italy with Lionel in 1368, the Pope sent envoys to try to dissuade the Union. Indeed, an extant letter from Bernabo Visconti to Edward III in 1367 thanks the English monarch for putting the English free companies at his service against the pontiff. It therefore seems doubtful that the figure in the fresco is indeed Edward de Spencer. Nevertheless, the do uh, Pope's diplomatic efforts against Lionel's marriage may yet provide a clue, an overlooked one, connecting the Spencer family and our Oshino uh, Archer, the Green uh, Squire, to the anonymous Gowan poet. Among those whom Pope Urban V con contacted in 1368 when Duke Lionel arrived in Italy was Sir Hugh de Spencer, identified in the documents as an English knight for the Diocese of Lincoln. This same Hugh came to Italy with Edward de Spencer and Lionel and participated in the subsequent campaign against Galeazzo Visconti in Piedmont. But unlike Edward, Hugh de Spencer appears in Florentine documents and is on the Florentine payroll from May 1360 to spring of 1370, I'm sorry, May 1370 to the spring of 1371 at the head of 30 lances. He is identified as Messer Ugo di Eduardo de Spencer. The title Messer indicates that he was a knight, as does his salary, 160 florins, which was very high. The name Ugo di Eduardo has been taken by me, unfortunately, in an earlier work, that he was Edward de Spencer's son, but in fact he was the son of Edward the Elder, and thus the brother of our Edward de Spencer. Hugh de Spencer is an interesting figure who has not yet been the subject of a biographical study, but he appears, um, through careful reconstruction of documentary evidence, to have been, uh, had a distinguished career fighting in Italy, and more so than his brother was closely associated with service to the papacy. Hugh de Spencer went on to Pope Urban V's crusade in Prussia in 1367 and fought for the, and fought for the Pope in 1373 against Bernardo uh, Visconti. When Hugh returned to England, he received important posts, amassed landed holdings and forged ties to King Richard II, with whom he went to Scotland in 1384 and Ireland in 1394. 
In short, Q Dispenser's verifiable presence in Florence and his service to the papacy, which included participation in a crusade, a major theme in the fresco, makes him a better candidate for inclusion in it. In, uh, unfortunately, however, Hugh, unlike his brother, was not a knight of the garter, which suggests, to me at least, that the whole issue of identifying an English figure in the fresco, and Vasari thought the man in white was not English, but the artist uh, Simabu, should be considered. But contemplation of Hugh's career rise, uh, raises interesting questions on the literary side. Florentine sur sources connect Hugh directly to Oshino Archer, our erstwhile green knight, who stood as guarantor of a loan given by Florence to Hugh when he took up service in 1370. Archer's own band appears to have been absorbed into Hugh's, and when Hugh left Florentine employ in 1371, Archer also disappeared. If, as the literary critic Anne Meyer suggested, the dispensers were possible patrons of the anonymous Gowan poet, the connection between Hugh and Archer, the Green Knight, assumes greater meaning. It opens up the possibility, albeit in a highly circumstantial way, that our Green Knight served as the model for the Gowan poem that some literary critics have looked for. Hugh Dispenser had extensive holdings in the Northwest Midlands, the region that scholars have proposed as the possible home of the Gowan poet. Hugh's will shows that he possessed land in Staffordshire, the presumed location of the Green Chapel of the poem, and held uh, at, at Vowson of the par parish church in Stockport in Cheshire, whose rector John Damaski has been considered as a potential author of the poem. Dispenser also had interests in Macclesfield, and his name appears on charters along with Richard Newton and Thomas Damasi, men associated with Cotton Nero A. 10 manuscript, which contains the Gowan poem. Finally, Hugh Dispenser was part of a circle of King uh, Richard II, a link that Michael J. Bennett saw as a prerequisite for the patron of the Gowan poem. In short, the case for Hugh is stronger than for any for own, I'm sorry. In short, uh, the case for Hugh is stronger than for any other of those currently proposed. Whether Hugh Dispenser was indeed the patron is a question that is ultimately best left to literary scholars. But what is clear from the preceding discussion is the involvement of Englishmen in Italy. Florence in particular, in the decade of the 1360s, had important consequences for military, artistic, and literary developments on the peninsula and the island.